time, my friends. Guess what time it is? You got it. It's time for How to Train Your Dragon with Hiccup, chapters 9 through 11. So let's get started. I'm excited. All right, let me pull up my picture screen. Here we go, how to train your dragon. Chapter nine, fear, vanity, revenge, and silly jokes. March turned into April and April turned into May. After Fireworm's remark about the pathetic bunny rabbit, Toothless never pooed in the kitchen again, but Hiccup hadn't made any further progress in training him. It was still raining, but it was a warm rain. The wind was blowing, but it was a less furious wind. It was just about possible to stand upright. The gulls' eggs were hatching on the rocks, and the parent gulls dive bomb hiccup and fish legs when they came to the long beach to practice. Kill, horror cow, kill, said fish legs to horror cow, who was calmly perched on his shoulder. You could have that black backed gull for breakfast. He's barely half your size. Honestly, Hiccup, I give up. I don't know how I'm going to pass the hunting section of the test. Horror Cow just doesn't have the killing instinct. She, she'd never survive in the wild. Hiccup laughed hollowly. You think you've got problems? Toothless and I are failing right from the beginning. The basic obedience commands, the retrieval, the compulsory ex exercises, the hunting, uh, the lot. It can't be that bad, said Fishlegs. Watch, said Hiccup. The boys moved along the beach a bit out of range of the goals. They started practicing the most basic command of all, go. The dragon was supposed to stand bolt upright on the handler's outstretched arm. The handler would then bark the command as loudly as possible while simultaneously lifting his arm to fling the dragon into the air. The dragon was supposed to soar gracefully into flight when the handler's arm reached its highest point. Horror cow yawned, stretched, scratched, and slowly flapped off, grumbling to herself. Toothless was even less obedient. Go, yelled Hiccup. Hiccup flung his arm up. Toothless hung on. I said go, Hiccup repeated in frustration. Why go, 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 shuddered Toothless, gripping even tighter. Just go, 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 screamed Hiccup, flapping his arm up and down frantically with Toothless hanging on to it for dear life. Toothless stayed. Toothless, said Hiccup as reasonably as he could. Please go. If you don't start going when I tell you to, we are both going to be thrown into exile. But I don't want to go, Toothless pointed out equally reasonably. Toothless Fish legs watched the whole process in appalled amazement. You really do have problems, he said in an odd voice. Yep, said Hiccup. He finally managed to uncurl Toothless's claws, which had relaxed their grip for a second, and pushed him off. Toothless landed on the sand with a squeal of outrage and immediately attached himself to Hiccup's leg, getting a good grip on the sandals with his talons and wrapping his wings around Hiccup's calf. N not going, said Toothless stubbornly. It can't get much worse than this, said Hiccup, so I'm going to try a new tack. He took out the notebook in which he had been jotting down all he knew about dragons in the hope that it might be useful. Dragon motivation, Hiccup read out loud. Number one, gratitude. Hiccup sighed. <sighs> Number two, fear. That works, but I can't do it. Three, four, five, greed, vanity, 
and revenge. Those are all worth a try. Six, jokes and riddling talk. Only if I'm desperate. This has got to be a first, drawled fish legs. But I'm with Gobber the Belch on this one. Why don't you just yell a bit louder? Hiccup ignored him. Okay, Toothless, said Hiccup to the little dragon who was pretending to be asleep as he held onto Hiccup's leg. For every fish you catch me, I will give you two more lobsters when you get home. All right, biking dragons and their eggs, the monstrous nightmare. The monstrous nightmare is the largest and most terrifying of the domestic dragons. Dazzling flyers, magnificent hunters, and fearsome fighters, they can be wild and difficult to train, but unofficial Viking law, only a chief or the son of a chief can own one. Statistics, colors, emerald green, brilliant scarlet, deepest purple, armed with scary fangs, extra extendable claws, defenses, nightmares don't need defenses, radar, none, poison, bite is slightly poisonous, hunting ability, amazing to watch, speed, fast, fear and fight factor, very, very scary. Toothless opened his eyes. Uh, uh, alive? He said eagerly. C can Toothless kill them? P -p -p Please? Just this once? No, Toothless, said Hiccup firmly. I keep on telling you, it isn't kind to torture creatures smaller than yourself. Toothless closed his eyes again. You're so, so b -b boring, he said sulkily. You're such a clever, quick dragon, Toothless, Hiccup flattered. I bet you could catch more fish than any of the others on Thursday, Thursday, if you wanted to. Toothless opened his eyes to consider the matter. T -t Twice as many, he said modestly, but I don't want to. This was unanswerable. Hiccup crossed vanity off his list. You know that big red fireworm dragon who is so rude to you, said Hiccup. Toothless spat on the ground in indignation. Said I was a newt with wings. Said I was an incontinent bunny rabbit. Toothless going to kill her. Toothless going to scratch her to death. Toothless going to, yes, 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 said Hiccup hastily. That fireworm dragon and her master who looks like a pig think that fireworm is going to catch more fish than anybody else at Thursday, Thursday celebrations. Think how silly they're going to look if you win the prize for most promising dragon instead of her. Toothless got off Hiccup's like, I will think about that said Toothless, and he waddled off a couple of feet and thought about it. Five minutes later, he was still thinking. He let out the odd chuckle every now and then, but every time Hiccup said, so, how about it then? He just replied, still thinking, go away. With a sigh, Hiccup put a line through revenge. Okay, said Fishlegs, looking over Hiccup's shoulder. You tried everything else. How about jokes and riddling top? I assume you're desperate. Toothless, said Hiccup, if you catch me a nice big mackerel, you'll be the cleverest, fastest dragon on Burp. And you will make that fireworm dragon look like an idiot. And you will have all the lobsters you can eat when we get home. And 
I will tell you a really good joke. Toothless turned around. Toothless loves jokes. He flapped onto Hiccup's arm again. All right, Toothless, help you. But, but, but not because me being nice or anything yucky. Uh, no, no, said Hiccup. Of course not. Us dragons, cruel and mean, but we do love a j -j joke. Tell me now, Hiccup laughed. No way, after you bring me a mackerel. Okay then, said Toothless. He jumped off Hiccup's arm and into the air. A dragon hunting is a very impressive sight, even a scrawny infant one like Toothless. He flew across the beach in his usual untidy lopsided fashion, shrieking a few insults along the way at any com corm cormorants that looked smaller than him. But as soon as he reached the sea, Toothless seemed to grow up a bit. The sea saw awoke in him some ancestral memory of the great pedigree hunting monsters that were his forefathers. He spread out his wings like a kite and flew fairly swiftly over the surface of the choppy waves, keeping his body and wings steady as he searched for the movement of fish. He spotted something and soared upward in circles until he was so high that Hiccup craning his neck backward on the beach could only just see him as a tiny speck. The speck was motionless for a second, and then Toothless dived, his wings folded by his sides, dropping like a stone out of the sky. He disappeared into the water and was gone for quite a while. Dragons can stay underwater for at least five minutes if they want to, and Toothless got quite distracted under there, chasing one fish and then another, unable to decide which was the biggest. Hiccup had gotten bored and was looking for oysters when Toothless came bursting triumphantly out of the sea, carrying a small mackerel. He dropped the mackerel at Hiccup's feet, did three somersaults in a row, and landed on Hiccup's head. He let out the dragon's cry of triumph, which is a bit like a rooster, crowing, but a lot louder and more self-satisfied. Then he leaned over and stared into Hiccup's eyes upside down. Not tell me a joke said Toothless. Whimpering wooden, said Hiccup. He did it. He really did it. T -t -t Tell me a joke, said Toothless again. What's black and white and red all over, asked Hiccup. Toothless didn't know. A sunburned penguin, replied Hiccup. It was a very, very old joke, but apparently it hadn't made it to Wild Dragon Cliff. Toothless thought it was hysterically funny. He flew, he flew off to catch more fish so he could hear more jokes. It was an enjoyable afternoon. The rain stopped, the sun shone, and Toothless didn't do too badly at all with hunting. He dropped a few fish and at one point wandered off entirely to chase rabbits on the clifftops. But he came back when Hiccup called eventually and by the end of a couple of hours, he had caught six medium-sized mackerel and a dogfish. All in all, Hiccup was pretty satisfied. After all, after all, he said to Fish Legs, it's not like I'm expecting to win the prize for most promising dragon or anything. All I need is to show that Toothless is basically under my control and for him to catch a few fish. We'll make fools of ourselves compared to Snotlout and his beastly hunting legend, but at least we'll have past initiation. What was more, as Toothless dropped the last mackerel on the heap in front of Hiccup, Fish Lakes noticed something sharp and gleaming in the dragon's lower jaw. Toothless has gotten his first tooth, said Fish Lakes. It seemed a very good omen. As they staggered home, they passed old Wrinkly, who had been sitting on our walk, watching them for the past couple of hours. Very impressive, wheezed old Wrinkly as the boys showed him the fish wrapped up in Hiccup's cloak. We reckon Hiccup really might pass the final initiation test on Thursday, Thursday, said Fish Legs excitedly. So you're still worrying about that piddly little test? Are you, Hiccup? 
asked Old Wrinkly. There are larger concerns, you know. There's a ginormous storm brewing up, for instance. It should hit us in about three days. Piddly little test, said Fishlegs indignantly. What do you mean, piddly little test? The Thursday, Thursday festival is the biggest event of the year. Everybody who's anybody will be there. All the hairy hooligans and the meatheads. Plus, this may not seem important to you, but anybody who fails this piddly little test gets put into exile to get eaten up by cannibals or something equally gruesome. I'm going to call myself Hiccup the Useful and his dragon Toothful, said Hiccup. Beaming. I thought of it just now and I'm really pleased with it. It's solid, dependable, not too flashy, and not too much to live up to. This reptile flying got his act together and caught some fish, said Fishlegs, pointing at Toothless, who was picking his nose with one claw. Incredible though it may seem, Hiccup may pass this test after all. Oh, I think it's almost a certainty said Old Wrinkly, looking at Toothless, who was now attempting to cross his eyes and was falling down in the process. Almost, repeated Old Wrinkly thoughtfully. And the boys went home, with Toothless following behind them, whining, Oh, carry me! Carry me! It's not far! My wings ache! Chapter 10 Thursday, Thursday. The Thursday, Thursday celebrations were a truly spectacular occasion. The hairy hooligans, fierce rivals, the meatheads from the nearby Meathead Islands, sailed across the inner ocean to the Isle of Burke for this great gathering. The visitors set up camp in Black Heart Bay, which turned overnight from an empty desert of echoing seagulls into a bustling village of tents made out of sails to patch to be used at sea anymore. By the next morning, the long beach was packed with stalls and jugglers and fortune tellers. There was a happy confusion of Vikings spotting old friends and practicing their sword play and yelling right at the children to stop hitting each other. Right now, for Thor's sake, no, I really mean it. This time, or, or, or else. That's Viking men sat on uncomfortable rocks. Guaffing loudly like gigantic sea lions in a holiday mood. Impressively large Viking women huddled in groups cackling like seagulls and downing whole mugs of tea in one swallow. Welcome to Thursday Thursday celebration. Program of events. Nine o'clock. Hammer throwing for the over 60s only. Meet up at the Marooner's Rock with your own hammer or somebody else's. Hard hats essential for spectators. 10.30, how many gold eggs can you eat in one minute? Baggy Bum, the beer belly, is the defending champion in this hotly contested competition. 11.30, ugliest baby contest. 12.30, axe fighting display. Admire the delicate art of fighting with axes. 2 o'clock, young heroes final initiation test. Watch tomorrow's Viking heroes as they compete whose dragon will be the most obedient and whose will catch the most fish. Blood tea, loud yelling, this sport has everything. 3.30, grand raffle and closing ceremony. Despite Old Wrinkly's gloomy forecast of terrible storms and typhoons, it was a glorious hot June day with not even a hint of cloud in the offing. The young hero's final initiation test would not start until 2 p.m. that afternoon, so Hookup spent the morning listening round-eyed to storytellers telling tall tales of Dirty Danes and Pirate Princesses. He was sick with nerves, so he found it difficult to enjoy the occasion as much as he had in previous years. Even Gobber throwing up during the how many goals eggs can you eat in one minute competition failed to raise more than a faint smile on his pale, tense face. Hiccup's Family had a picnic lunch overlooking the axe fighting display. Hiccup could not eat a thing, or, and nor, unusually, could Toothless, 
who was in a difficult mood and turned his nose up at the tuna sandwich Balarama offered. Remember, Balarama is Hiccup's mother. Good to keep your dragon's appetite sharp for the game, boomed Stoke the Vast, who was in an excellent mood. He had won a bet on Goggle Toad in the Ugliest Baby Contest and was looking forward to seeing his son's brilliant display during the initiation test. As the day wore on, a hot wind suddenly started blowing out of nowhere. It was still sweltering, but ominous gray clouds were gathering on the horizon. There was the odd rumble of thunder in the air. Maybe old Wrinkly had been right, thought Hiccup as he gazed upward. And Thor's going to put in his traditional appearance at the Thor's Day Thursday celebration. <coughs> well, all youths hoping to be initiated into the tribes this year, please make their way to the ground at the left of the beach. <coughs> Hiccup gulped, nudged Toothless, and stood up. This was it. Hiccup was one of the last to get to the ground, which was a large area of wet sand just at the edge of the sea. The boys from his own tribe were already assembled, their dragons, hovering a couple of feet above them. Everybody was chattering excitedly. Even Snotlout was looking nervous. The meathead boys and their dragons seemed to be gigantic, rough-looking customers, far tougher than the hooligans. One in particular was a great hulking brute of a boy who looked 15 at least. Thuggery the Meathead and his Dragon Killer. Hiccup presumed he was Thuggery, chief of Magadon, the Meathead's son, because a silver gray monstrous, monstrous nightmare about three feet tall was perched on one of his shoulders. It was looking at Fireworm like a Rottweiler thinking evil thoughts. Fireworm acted unconcerned. An aristocrat never growls, purred Fireworm sweetly. You must be one of those mongrel nightmares. We purr green bloods descended from the great Ripper Claw himself would never dream of doing anything so common. The silver nightmares growling increased in volume. The crowd was assembling at the touch line. Hiccup tried not to notice Stoic the Vast blasting his way to the front with great cries of, out of my way, I'm a chief. 10 to one, my son catches more fish than your son in this test. Boom Stoic giving his old enemy, Mugadon the meathead, a good prod in the stomach. Mugadon, the meathead, narrowed his eyes and wondered whether to hit him, maybe after the test. And which, asked Mugadon, the meathead, is your son? Is he the tall one who looks like a pig with the skeleton tattoos and the red monstrous nightmare? Nope, said Stoic happily. That's my brother Bagabum's son. My son is that skinny one over there with a toothless daydream. Mugadun the meathead broke into a big smile. He slapped Stoic on the back and yelled, I take your bet and double it. Done, shouted Stoic, and the two great chieftains shook hands and bumped bellies on the bet. Gobber the Belch was in charge of the final stage of the initiation test. He was still looking a bit green from his unpleasant experience in the how many goal eggs can you eat in one minute competition. This had not improved his temper. All right, you orderly what? Yelled Gobber. This is where we find out if you are the stuff that heroes are made of. You will either walk out of this arena full members of the noble tribes of hairy hooligans and merciless meheads or go into miserable exile forever from the inner isles. Let's see which is going to be, shall we? And he grinned nastily at the 20 boys standing before him. I shall begin by inspecting you and your animals as if you were warriors about to go into battle. I shall introduce you to the watching members of the tribes you hope to enter. 
Then the test will begin. You will demonstrate how you have asserted yourself over these wild creatures and tamed them by sheer force of your heroic personalities. You will start by performing the basic commands of go, stay, and fetch. You will end by ordering your reptile to hunt fish for you as your forefathers have done before you. Hiccup swallowed nervously. The boy in dragon who most impressed the judge and that is me, Gobber bared his teeth grimly, will receive the extra glory being called the hero of heroes and most promising dragon. The boys and dragons who fail this test will say farewell to their families forever and leave the tribe to go where we do not care. Gobber paused. Power train, muttered Fishlegs just loud enough for Gobber to hear. Gobber glared at him. Heroes or exiles, yelled Gobber the Belt. Heroes or exiles, yelled 18 boys fran fanatically back at him. Heroes or exiles, yelled the watching hooligan and meathead tribes. Please let me be a bit of a hero just this once. Hiccup and fish legs each thought to themselves, nothing too spectacular or anything, just to get through this test. Stand to attention with your dragons on your right arms, yelled Gobber the Belt. Gobber walked down the row of boys for the inspection. Beautiful turnout, Gobber congratulated Thuggery and Meathead on his nightmare dragon killer who spread out his shining wings to show off a wingspan of about four feet. Gobber stopped abruptly when he got to Hiccup. And what in the name of Wooden, demanded Gobber, blanching a little, is this? It's a toothless daydream, sir, muttered Hiccup. Small but vicious, added Fishlegs helpfully. Toothless daydream, blustered Gobber. That's the smallest common or garden I've ever seen. What do you think I am, an idiot? No, no, sir, murmured Fishlegs reassuringly. Just a little on the slow side. Gobber glowered dangerously. A toothless daydream, explained Hiccup, looks exactly like a common or garden except for the characteristic wart on the end of its nose. Silence, said Gobber in a very loud whisper. Or I shall throw you all the way to the meat mainland. I hope, he continued, that this dragon hunts better than it looks. You and your fishy friend here are the worst candidates for initiation I've ever had the dis pleasure of teaching but you are the future of this tribe hiccup and if you shame us in front of the meheads i personally will never forgive you do you understand hiccup nodded each boy then stepped forward to bow and hold up his dragon for the spectators to applaud there was huge clapping for snotflace snotlout and his dragon fireworm rivaled only by the mighty cheering for thuggery the meathead and his dragon killer I give you last but not least, Gobber the Belt was trying to put a bit enthusiasm into his yelling. The fearsome, they're terrible, the only son of Stoic the Vast, hook up the useful and his dragon toothful. He got stepped forward and held up Toothless as high as he could to make him look a bit bigger. There was a slightly appalled silence. People had seen dragons this small before, of course, normally scampering about after field mice in the wild, but not as noble hunting dragons competing in initiation. Size isn't everything, boomed Stoic so loudly that you could have heard him several beaches away, and he banged his great hands together to start the applause. Everyone was terrified of Stoke's famous temper, so they joined in with polite, wild cheering. Toothless was still in a mood, but he was delighted to be the center of attention, and he puffed out his chest and bowed solemnly to left 
and to right. A few of the meatheads snickered. I've changed my mind, thought Hiccup, closing his eyes. This is the worst moment of my life so far. <sighs> okay, Toothless, he whispered into a little dragon's ear. This is our big chance. Catch lots of fish here, and I will tell you more jokes than you've ever heard in your life, which will make that big red fire room dragon really cross. Toothless took a sideways glance at Fireworm. She was sharpening her nails on Snotlout's helmet with the smug certainty of a dragon who knows she's about to win the prize for most promising dragon. Burp! The test began. Toothless didn't do too badly in their early obedience exercises, though he clearly thought it was extremely dull. It was now training quite hard and Toothless hated the rain. Oh, sorry. It was now raining quite hard and Toothless hated the rain. He wanted to go home and relax in front of a nice warm fire. Fireworm and Killer were going and fetching as soon as Snotlout and Thuggery commanded and they were diving and breathing out fire as they did so just to show off. Fireworm did some fancy acrobatic somersaults that had the crowd screaming and stampering their feet. Start your hunting, yelled Gobber the Belch. Every dragon except Toothless flew out to sea. Toothless flapped back to Hiccup's shoulder. Toothless got a tummy ache, he complained. Hiccup tried not to see his father looking surprised on the sidelines. He tried not to notice the crowd whispering to each other. Oh, that's Stokes on over there. No, not the tall one with the skeleton tattoos who looks like a pig. The small, skinny one who can't even control his municipal dragon. Don't forget, Toothless, said Hiccup through gritted teeth. The fish. I'm going to tell you all the jokes I've ever heard. Remember? Just tell me now, said Toothless. Help came from an unexpected quarter. Snotlout broke off from yelling. Kill, fireworm! Kill! To lean over and sneer at Hiccup. <laughs> what are you? you? What are you doing, Hiccup? You're not talking to that newt with wings, are you? Talking to dragons against the rules and forbidden by order of Stoke the Vast, your wimpy father. N -n newt with wings? Repeated Toothless. N -n -n newt with wings? You're not a newt with wings, are you, Toothless? Said Hiccup. You're the best hunter in the world, aren't you? Too right I am, said Toothless grumpily. You show that snot they snot low and his snobby dragon what a real hunting dragon can do, said Hiccup urgently. Okay then, said Toothless. Hiccup heaved a huge sigh of relief as Toothless took off in shambolic fashion in the general direction of the sea. This is too good to be true, Hiccup said to himself ten minutes later as Toothless returned from a second trip, clearly too bored for words, but dropping a couple of herring at Hiccup's feet. In about a half an hour, I, Hiccup, will become a fully paid-up member of the Harry Hooligan tribe. It was too good to be true. Fireworm was just flying back to Snotlout with her twentieth fish, her green cat's eyes snapping with triumph when Toothless called out, Sloppy snob! Fireworm stopped in midair, her head whipped round, her eyes narrowing. What did you say? hissed Fireworm. Oh no, said Hiccup. No, Toothless, no, don't do it, don't do it. Sloppy snob, jeered Toothless. Is that the best you can do? It's p -p -p pathetic, hopeless, useless. You nightmares think you're so cruel, but you're so s sloppy as scallops. You, hissed Fireworm, her ears dangerously back as she crept forward through the air like a leopard about to spring. Are a little liar. And you, said Toothless calmly, are a rabbit-hearted, seaweed brain Winkling eating snob. Fireworm went for him. 
toothless streaked off as quick as lightning and Fireworm's massive jaws snapped together with sickening crunch on nothing but thin air. Chaos ensued. Fireworm completely lost control. She plunged wildly through the air, claws out, biting anything that moved and letting out great bursts of flame. Unfortunately, in the process, she accidentally scratched Killer, a dragon with very short temper. Killer then attacked any hooligan dragon with biting distance. Soon, the dragons were involved in a full-scale, rip-roaring dragon fight, with the boys running around shouting at them to stop and trying to pull them apart without getting killed themselves. The dragons took absolutely no notice whatsoever, however, ha however, har however how hard the boys yelled. And Thuggery and Snala were very red in the face after some pretty impressive yelling. Gobber the Belch went ballistic on the sidelines. Can somebody tell me what the thing of Thor and Wooden's name Amyashala is happening? Toothless was in his element in this kind of chaos, dodging Firearm's angry lunges with ease, nipping with the lively bite at alligator here, and a scratch at bright claw there, obviously enjoying the fight enormously. Even a horror cow showed a great deal of spirit for our dragon who was supposedly vegetarian. She managed to give Fireworm a truly impressive bite on the bottom as Fireworm and Killer rolled through the air, biting chunks out of one another. Oh my. Gobber the Belch entered the fray, grabbing hold of Fireworm's tail. Fireworm gave a howl of outrage, squirmed around, and set Gobber's beard on fire. With one massive hand, Gobber swatted at the fire. With the other, he clamped Fireworm's jaws together so she could neither bite nor burn. He tucked the fiercely enraged animal under one arm, still holding her mouth closed. Stop! screamed Gobber the Belt with a hairy, raising skin, crawling, fang, dropping yell that reverberated off the cliffs, bounced off the sea, and whose faint Echoes could be heard on the mainland. The boys stopped their useless screaming. The dragon stopped in midair. There was an awful silence. Even the watching crowd went quiet. This had never happened before. All 20 boys had shown themselves to be completely out of control of their dragons during the initiation test. Technically, this meant that all of them should be thrown out of their tribes into exile. And exile in this horrid climate could mean death. Food was scarce, the sea was dangerous, and there were certain wild tribes in the isles who were rumored to be cannibals. Garber the Belt stood lost for words, his beard still smoking. When he eventually spoke, his voice was deep with the horror of the situation. I will have to speak with the elders of the tribes, was all he said. He dropped Fireworm on the ground. She had come to her senses and now slunk towards Snoutlout, her tail between her legs. The elders of the tribes were Mugadon and Stoic, Gobber himself, and a few more of the more fearsome warriors, such as Terrible Tusnet, the Vicious Twins, and the Hairy Scary Librarian from the Meathead Public Library. The crowd and the boys stood absolutely still as the elders consulted in the traditional elder huddle, which looked a bit like a rugby scrum. <laughs> Meanwhile, the storm was getting worse. Huge claps of thunder burst over their heads. The rain poured down and they couldn't have been much wetter. They had all jumped into the sea. The elders consulted for a long time. Mugadon got angry at one point and swung a fist at Tufnut. A twin held on to each of his arms until he calmed down again. Eventually, Stoic came out of the huddle and stood before the boys who were hanging their heads in shame, the dragons at their feet. If Hiccup had been able to look at his father, he would have seen that Stoic was not his normal, merry, violent self. He looked very solemn indeed. Novices of the tribes! He bellowed grimly. This is a very bad day for all of you. You have failed the final test of the initiation program. By the fierce law of the inner isles, this means that you should be cast out from the tribes until into exile forever. 
I do not want to do this, not only because my own son is among you, but also because it will mean that a whole generation of warriors is lost from the tribes. But we cannot ignore our law. Only the strong can be long, in case the blood of the tribes should be weakened. Only heroes can be hooligans and meatheads. Stoic jabbed a fat finger at the heavens. Furthermore, he carried on, the god Thor is really very angry. This is not the moment to weaken our laws. Thor let out a great crash of thunder as if to underline this point. Under normal circumstances, says Stoic, the ceremony of exile will start now. But going to sea in weather like this would mean certain death for all concerned. As an act of mercy, I will allow you one more night of shelter under my roof, and first thing tomorrow morning you will be set ashore on the mainland to, to, do, to fend for yourselves. From this moment forth, you are all banished and may not talk to any other member of your tribe. The thunder crashed all around the boys as they stood, heads bowed in the rain. Pity me, for this is the saddest thing I have ever had to do to banish my own son, says Stoic sadly. The crowd murmured sympathetically, applauding the nobility of their leader. A chief cannot live like other people, says Stoic, looking almost pleadingly at Hiccup. He has to decide what is for the good of the tribe. Suddenly Hiccup was very angry. Well, don't expect me to pity you, said Hiccup. What kind of father thinks his silly laws are more important than his own son? And what kind of silly tribe is this anyway that it can't just have ordinary people in it? Stoic stood looking down at his son in surprise and shock for a moment. Then he turned round and trudged off. The tribes were already running off the beach and scrambling up the hillsides toward the shelter of the village, lightning coming down all around them. I'm going to kill you hissed Snotlout as Hiccup fireworms snarling menacing from his shoulder. First thing, after we're banished, I'm going to kill you. He ran off after the others. I've lost m my t -t tooth, Toothless complained whinily. C came out when I bit that fireworm dragon. Hiccup took no notice. He looked up at the heavens beside himself with fury as the wind scooped up seawater in handfuls and flung it straight into his face. Just once, yelled Hiccup. Why couldn't you let me be a hero just once? I didn't want anything amazing just to pass this silly test so I could become a proper Viking like everybody else. Thor's thunder boomed and crackled above him blackly. Okay, then, screamed Hiccup. Hit me with your silly lightning. Just do something to show you're thinking about me at all. But there were to be no bolts of lightning for Hiccup. Thor clearly didn't think he was important enough for an answer. The storm moved on out to sea. Chapter 11, Thor is angry. The storm raged through the whole of the night. Hiccup lay unable to sleep as the wind hurled about the walls like 50 dragons trying to get in. Let us in, let us in, shrieked the wind. We're very, very hungry. Out in the blackness and way out to sea, the storm was so wild and the waves so gigantic that they disturbed the sleep of a couple of very ancient sea dragons indeed. The first dragon was averagely enormous, about the size of a largest cliff. The second dragon was gobsmackingly vast. He was that monster mentioned earlier in the story, the great beast who had been sleeping off. 
his Roman picnic for the past six centuries or so, the one who had recently been drifting into a lighter sleep. The great storm lifted both dragons gently from the seabed like a couple of sleeping babies and washed them on the swell of one indescribably enormous wave onto the long beach outside Hiccup's village. And there they stayed, sleeping peacefully, while the wind shrieked horribly all around them like wild Viking ghosts having a loud party in Vala, until the storm blew its out and the sun came up on the beach full of dragon and very little else. The first dragon was enough to give you nightmares. The second dragon was enough to give you nightmares, nightmares. Imagine an animal about 20 times as large as a Tyrannosaurus Rex, more like a mountain than a living creature, a great glistening evil mountain. He was so encrusted with barnacles, he looked like he was wearing a kind of jeweled armor, but where the little crustaceans and the coral couldn't get a grip in the joints and cranings of him, you could see his true color, a glorious dark green. It was the color of the ocean itself. He was awake now and he had coughed up the last thing he had eaten, the standard of the Eighth Legion with his pathetic ribbon still flying bravely. He was using it as a toothpick and the eagle was proving very useful for teasing out those irritating little pieces of flesh that get stuck between your 20 foot back teeth. The first person to discover the dragons was Bad Breath the Grub, who set out every early to check out his nets and fared in the storm. Who set out very early to check how his nets had fared in the storm. He took one look at the beach, rushed to the chief's house, and woke him up. We have a problem, said Bad Breath. What do you mean, a problem? Snapped Stoic the Vast. Stoic had not slept well at all. He had lain awake worrying. What kind of father did put his precious laws before the life of his son? But then what kind of son would fail the precious laws that his father had looked up to and believed in all his life? By morning, Stoke had made the awesome decision that he was going to reverse the solemn pronouncement he had made on the beach and unbanish Hiccup and the other boys. It is weak of me, weak says Stoic to himself gloomily. Squid face the terrible would have banished his son in the twinkling of an eye. Loud mouth the gouty would have positively enjoyed it. What is the matter with me? I should be banished myself, and no doubt that is what Mogadon the meat is going to suggest. All in all, Stoic was not in a state to deal with any more problems. There are a couple of humongous dragons on the long beach, said Bad Breath. Tell them to go away, said Stoic. You tell them, said Bad Breath. Stoic stomped off to the beach. He returned again, looking very thoughtful. Did you tell them? asked Bad Breath. Tell it, said Stoic. The larger dragon has eaten the smaller one. I didn't like to interrupt. I think I should call a council of war. The hooligans and the meatheads woke that morning to the terrible sound of the big drums summoning them to the council of war, only used in times of dreadful crisis. Hiccup awoke with a start. He had hardly slept at all. Toothless, who had crept into bed with Hiccup the night before, was nowhere to be seen, and the bed was stone cold, so he had obviously been gone for some time. Hiccup dragged his clothes on hurriedly. They had dried overnight and were so stiff with salt that it was like putting on a shirt and leggings made out of wood. He wasn't sure what he was meant to do, as this was the morning he was supposed to go into exile. He followed everybody else to the Great Hall. The meatheads had spent the night there anyway because it had not been the weather for camping. On the way, he bumped into fish legs. He looked as if he had slept as badly as Hiccup. His glasses were on crooked. What's happening? asked Hiccup. Fist Lake shrugged his shoulders. Where's Horror Cow? asked Hiccup. Fish Lake shrugged his shoulders again. 
Hiccup looked around at the crowd pushing its way toward the great hall and noticed that there was not a domestic dragon to be seen. Normally, they were never far from their master's heels and shoulders, yapping and snarling and sneering at each other. There was something faintly sinister about their disappearance. Nobody else had noticed. There was a tremendous babble of excitement and such a crush of enormous Vikings that not everybody could get into the great hall. And there was a big jumble of barbarians shouting and shoving outside. Stoic call for silence. I have called you here today, boomed Stoic, because we have a problem on our hands. A rather large dragon is sitting on the long beach. The crowd was deeply impressed. Unimpressed. The crowd was deeply unimpressed. They were hoping for a more important crisis. Mugadoon voiced the general disapproval. The big drums are only used in times of ghastly, deadly peril, said Mugadon in amazement. You have summoned us here at a horribly early hour. Mugadon had not slept well on the stone floor of the Great Hall with only his helmet for a pillow. Just because of a dragon? I do hope you're not look losing your grip, stoic, he sneered, hoping that he was. This is no ordinary dragon, says stoic. This dragon is huge, enormous, gobsmackingly vast. I've never seen anything like it. This is more of a mountain than a dragon. Not having seen the dragon mountain, the Vikings remained unimpressed. They were used to bossing dragons about. The dragon, says Stoic, must of course be moved but it is a very big dragon. What should we do, old wrinkly? You're the thinker in the tribe. You flatter me, stoic, said old wrinkly, who seemed rather amused by the whole thing. It is a sea dragonus giganticus maximus, and particularly big one, I'd say. Very cruel, very intelligent, ravenous appetite. But by my field is early Icelandic poetry, not large reptiles. Professor Yabish is the Viking expert on the subject of dragons. Perhaps you should consult his book on the subject. Of course, says Stoic. How to train your dragon, wasn't it? I do believe that Gobber burgled that very book from the Meathead Public Library. He gave a naughty look at Mugadon the Meathead. This is outrageous, booed Mugadon. That book is meathead property. I demand an instant return, or I shall declare war on the spot. Oh, put a sock in it, Mugadon, said Stoic. With wimpy librarians like yours, what can you expect? The hairy, scary librarian blushed a delicate pink and shook his size 18 shoes. Bagabom, hand me the book from the fireplace yelled Stoic. Bagabum stretched out one of his great octopus arms and picked the book off the shelf. He lopped it across the heads of the crowd and Stoic caught it to much cheering. Morale was high. Stoic bowed to the hoarders and handed the book to Gobber. Gobber! 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 yelled the crowd. It was Gobber's moment of triumph. A crisis demands a hero and he knew he was a man for the job. His chest swelled with self-importance. Oh, it was really nothing, he bellowed modestly. A bit of bas basic burglary, you know, keeps me on practice. <sighs> it's the crowd like sea snakes as Gobber cleared his throat. How to train your dragon, announced Gobber solemnly. He paused. Yell at it! There was another pause. And, says Stoic, yell at it, and... That's it, said Gobber. Yell at it! There's nothing in there about the sea dragon as Giganticus Maximus in particular? Asked Stoic. Gobber looked through the book again. Not as such, said Gobber. 
just the bit about yelling at it. Really? Hmm, says Stoke. It's brief, isn't it? I've never noticed before, but it's brief. Brief, but not to the point, he added hastily. Like us Vikings, thank Thor for our experts. No, says Stoke in his most chief-like manner. Since it's such a large dragon. Uh, vast, interrupted Old Wrinkly happily. Gigantic, stupendously enormous. Five times as big as the big blue whale. Yes, thank you, Old Wrinkly, says Stoic. Since it is indeed on the rather large side, we're going to need a rather large yell. I want everybody on the clifftop yelling at the same time. Uh, what shall we yell? asked Baggy Bomb. Something brief and to the point. Go away, said Stoic. The tribes of the Meathead Hooligan gathered at the top of the cliffs of the Long Beach and looked down at the impossibly vast serpent stretched out on the sand smacking his lips as it devoured the last morsels of his late unfortunate companion. It was so big that it seemed unlikely that it could be alive until you saw it move like an earthquake or a trick of the eyes. There are times when size really is important, thought Hiccup to himself, and this is one of them. Dragons are vain, cruel, and amoral creatures. As I've said, this is all very well when they are a lot smaller than you are. But when a dragon's bad nature is multiplied into something the size of a hillside, how do you deal with it? Gobber the Belt stepped forward to lead the yelling as the most respected yeller among them all. His chest swelled with pride. One, two, three. Four hundred Viking voices screamed as one. Go away! And added for good measure the Viking war cry. Oh! The Viking war cry was designed to chill the blood of Viking enemies at the commencement of battle. It is a horrifying, electrifying shriek that begins by mimicking the furious yell of a swooping predator which then turns into the victim's scream of pure terror and ends with a horribly realistic imitation of the death gurgles as he chokes on his own blood. It is a scary noise at the best of times, but shouted all together by 400 barbarians at eight o'clock in the morning, it was enough to make the mighty Thor himself drop his hammer and cry like a little baby. There was an impressive silence. The mighty dragon then turned his mighty head in their direction. There were 400 gasps as a pair of evil yellow eyes as big as six tall men narrowed down to slits. The dragon opened its mouth and let out a sound so loud and so terrifying that four or five passing seagulls dropped down dead with fear on the spot. It was a noise that made the Viking war cry seem like the faint cry of a newborn baby in comparison. It was a terrible, alien, otherworldly noise that promised death and no mercy and everything awful. There was another impressive silence. With one delicate movement of his talon, the dragon ripped through Gobber's tunic and trousers from head to toe as if he were peeling fruit. Gobber gave a most unheroic shriek of outraged modesty. The dragon placed the same talons upright in front of Gobber the belt and flicked him like a spitball way, way away over the Viking heads and over the walled fortifications of the village. Bye-bye, Gobber. The dragon put his vast cracked old paw to his reptilian lips and blew the Vikings a kiss. The kiss streaked through the sky and scored a direct hit on both Stoic and Mugadun's ships, which had survived the storm and were rocking in the safety of Hooligan Harbor. All 50 of them burst simultaneously into flames. The Vikings ran away from that cliff as fast as their 800 legs could carry them.
Gobber the Belch had the luck to land on the roof of his own house. The deep layers of saga grass broke his fall as he went through them, and he ended up sitting in his own chair in front of the fire, dazed but unharmed. Okay, then, says Stoic to 400 Vikings, suddenly looking scared but widely overexcited. So the yelling doesn't work. They had reassembled in the center of the village. And as our fleet is out of action, we have no means of escape from the island. Stoic continued. What we need now, he said, trying to sound as if he was on top of the situation, is for somebody to go and ask the monster whether he comes in peace or in war. I shall go, volunteered a gobber, who rejoined them at that moment, still determined to be the hero of the hour. He was trying to sound noble and dignified, but it was very difficult to be truly dignified with grass in your hair and wearing your cousin's Agatha's dress, which was the only thing Gobber could find to wear in the house. Do you speak Dragonese, Gobber? asked Stoic in surprise. Well, no, Gobber admitted. Nobody here speaks Dragonese. It's forbidden by order of Stoic the Vast, or hear his name in trouble. Ugh, ugh. Dragons are inferior creatures who we yell at. Dragons might get above themselves if we talk to them. Dragons are tricksy and must be kept in their place. Hiccup can speak to dragons, said Fishlegs very quietly from the middle of the crowd. Shh. Fish legs, whispered Hiccup, desperately digging his friends in the rib. Well, you can, said Fish legs stoutly. Do you see? This is your chance to be a hero, and we're all going to die anyway, so you might as well take it. Hiccup can speak to dragons, shouted Fish legs very loudly indeed. Hiccup, said Gobber the Belch. Hiccup! said Stoic the Vast. Yes, Hiccup, said Old Wrinkly. Small boy, red hair, freckles, you were going to put him into exile this morning? Old Wrinkly looked stern. In order that the blood of the tribe should not be weakened, remember your son, Hiccup? I know who Hiccup is, thank you, Old Wrinkly, says Stoic the Vast unforgettably uncomfortably. Does anyone know where he is? Hook up! Come forward! It looks like you could come in useful after all, Old Wrinkly murmured to himself. Here he is! yelled Fishlegs, patting Hiccup on the back. Hiccup started to wriggle through the crowd until somebody noticed him and dragged him up, and he was passed over everybody's heads and put down in front of Stoic. Hiccup, said Stoic. Is it true that you can talk to dragons? Hiccup nodded. Stoke gave an awkward cough. <clears throat> this is an embarrassing situation. I know that we're about to banish you from the tribe. However, if you do what I ask, I am sure I speak for everybody when I say that you can consider yourself unbanished. We stand in awful peril and nobody else in the room can speak dragonese. Will you go to this monster and ask him whether he comes in peace or in war? Hiccup said nothing. Stoic coughed again. <clears throat> you can tell me, said Stoic. I've unbanished you. So the exile is off then, is it, father? Asked Hiccup. If I go and kill myself talking to this beast from hell, I will be considered heroic enough to join the tribe of hooligans? Stoic looked more embarrassed than ever. Absolutely, he said. Okay, then, said Hiccup. I'll do it.
And that is the end of our time. Okay, a lot of exciting things happening with Hiccup and for the two tribes itself. So when we get back, we'll have to read chapter 12, The Green Death. Gotta wait until next week. All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed this time with How to Train Your Dragon, and I can't wait to tell you the rest of the book. Bye.